and we are talking in part three about the Paticca Samapada, the uh, dependent arising that the Buddha taught, and what he proposed that we should uh, do with understanding this and how it relates to everyday life. How does it relate to your practice? And we have talked about uh, several things about meditation and mindfulness, about delusion, about craving, about the purification of mind and the retraining of mind. And the imp most important thing is we identified craving, which is the root of the suffering that is caused for us. And we have said basically that it has a symptom. And once something has a symptom and we can see how it uh, is a problem, then we can fix it usually. So craving has, uh, craving always manifests as tension and tightness in the mind and in the body and therefore if we can lower the tension in our mind and body, we can feel the arising feelings as contact happens within our mind and thoughts come up to bother us. The hindrances, when they start to arise, we can feel them arising, learn to be sensitive enough to feel the change in the tension and the tightness that's in the, the mind and in the body. So this is what we're trying to do with this practice. We've identified a very simple practice that we can use where we first are sitting very still and very calm. And if we talk about this, what are you doing when you are meditating? You have six sense doors. Your experiences with your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, your body. So, uh, and then the sixth one is your internal mind. So what's happening to you when you are meditating? How are you going to watch, learn to see mind's attention with all these things going on is the question people ask sometimes. Okay, we're going to close our eyes. We're going to sit in a very calm position. We don't want our body to be erect erect. We want it to be nicely straight, but not when we say erect, we don't want it to be stiff. So we're going to sit in whatever position we're comfortable in, on the floor or on a chair. Now, when you're sitting on a chair, one of the best things for you to do is to be able to sit on a chair that is high enough so that when your uh, leg extends from your hip to your knee, it comes out to the edge of the chair, and when the leg goes straight down, the knee is at the same level as the hip. So sometimes if you're in a low chair, you're going to have a lot of pain in your hip because your hip will be low and your knee will be higher, okay? But if you're sitting with that right angle from your hip to your knee and then down to the floor, you can be pretty comfortable and relax in the chair. Now you might prefer that you have a chair without arms on it because sometimes if you sit like I'm sitting right now and you rest your arms on here, you can jam your shoulders because what happens is your arm, this arm starts to push against the seat and you find yourself, you might slump a little bit, you feel the pressure pushing on your shoulder blades, you don't want to do that. So actually the best thing is to have a seat without the arms and just rest the hands. Now the position of the hands, how important is this? Well, this is a recycling of energy position where this cycle of energy is running in your back and in some traditions this is very important to be aware that there is an energy cycle that's running uh, up your back and it can uh, run over your head and then down through the front of your body so you want to be straight for that reason and open you want your chest to be slightly high you want your neck and body aligned very well but if you're, that energy can run down your arms and cycle all through your body like a bio circuit. So you can sit like this if you want to, but it's nothing that is urgent. It's not urgent to do that, okay? The big thing that is urgent for you is to sit absolutely still, okay, and not move, and to rest your hands either in the position with the right hand on top of the left hand, 
or to the Burmese often put their hands like this over their knees. I don't know if you can see this, but I would put the uh, position of the hands resting just on the knees like this. And if your legs were folded like that, that's fine, but you can just rest them like that. The whole point is how are you comfortable with your body so that you're not going to move at all. That's the big one. So your eyes are closed when you're meditating and in that way you have secluded the um, pleasure of sight. You're told to let anything that you hear, any sounds, just go. Any, any sounds that you hear are just sounds and not you, not important to pay attention to. So as you train yourself to just let it go, let it go, let it go, these sounds begin to sound like they're way far away down a tunnel, okay? With your nose, if you smell any odors, it's the same rule. Just let it go. It's just an odor. Just let it go. If it's ammonia, please leave the building. <laughs> Okay, if it's gas or something like that, get out now, okay? But I'm saying, normally speaking, you sit in an area where you don't have a lot of smells going on. Don't set up your meditation uh, spot in the place where your wife is cooking in the next room the best and favorite meal of yours, and that's all you can think about. Okay, you don't want to do that, because your mind is going to be on that. Okay, the next piece is uh, your taste. You might want to wash your mouth out with baking soda and water. Just slush it around and spit it out. That's the easiest, cheapest way to clean your mouth out and not have any odors, uh, any tastes coming up in your mouth, okay? Your body is the, we said the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the body. Your body is sitting still. So now your body is there and your eyes are closing. What's left? Mind. Mind is left. So this is nice because that's what the Buddha said. Watch the movements of your mind. Watch what's happening. By, by learning to observe. Now, are we watching the object of meditation or are we watching for the movements of mind? What's happening here is we're choosing an object of meditation and we like to teach metta. The reason we like to teach metta is because the uh, metta, the karuna, okay, the loving kindness, the compassion, the joy, and the equanimity. These four pieces progress very rapidly towards total cessation. Also, they're highly needed in the world right now. And people have uh, lost their taste for smiling and they don't laugh as easily in a lot of countries. Not everybody is from a happy, happy country. You know, not everybody's grown up in an atmosphere where we learn to just let things go. It's, it's tough in a lot of places. So in order to let go of the tenseness and the stress, you just sit and simply relax. Now, as you relax, you need an object of meditation. For what? What is it the object of meditation is actually for? The meditation object is a recentering point. It's a point where you come back to. So if you're pulled away, you have some place to come back to. The idea of meditating without any meditation object is almost like nonsense, if not nonsense, because there's no organization or structure to the meditation. And you're just going to go over here when you're finished, or over here when you're finished, or over here. And there's not, it's a very difficult thing because you're never still long enough to make any real progress. But if you have a focal point, just an object that you're using, and loving kindness can be this object. So when we're practicing loving kindness, I'm going to give you some instructions for the loving kindness. And I hope that you will work with this and we will uh, do a little bit more on this. Uh, so that you understand what to do if things get in the way. But what you do with the loving kindness is you first bring up a feeling in your heart, bring up a time when you were very, very happy. Uh, if ladies are out there and we're married, we often remember that our first baby was a very special time or the time that we took our vows and got married was a very special time. Or if you that isn't there, you go back to grandma, and if you sat on grandma's lap and she was, 
you know, when you were little and she had you on a swing and you looked up and Grandma was there and she's telling you stories. That's a great memory. It's a nice, warm memory. It's a contented memory. It's very pleasing and very wholesome. And you just bring up the feeling that you had of that time into your heart and begin to feel the warmth of that memory in your heart, in your chest. And when you have this warm, happy feeling in your chest, then what you do is you start sending loving and kind thoughts to yourself first. And you say, oh, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> I thought you were going to teach me loving kindness to send out to the whole universe. Ooh, what's this, a jip? <laughs> this, uh, you know, you're not going to do this? How come? <laughs> I am going to do that. But what I'm doing first is I'm getting you aligned or uh, in the right position so that you can actually become aware that the loving kindness is a power that you can use in the world. See, today a lot of times we find the loving kindness taught, but we find loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity taught in 30 minutes. Thank you very much. See you next week. That's not what I'm showing you. What I'm showing you here is that if you work only with one spiritual friend for a period of time, say about two weeks or three weeks long, and you work just with that one spiritual friend until they smile back at you in your mind, you will be developing the power of doing this and understanding how it feels as you're doing it. So we choose a spiritual friend to send the loving kindness to after we're sending it to ourselves for about 10 minutes, we, we usually say, we do not say a mantra when we do this. We simply say, may I be happy, may my mind be peaceful, may my mind be calm. That's all. You can say it two times. Don't say it any more than that because we don't want it to be, may I be happy, 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 happy, happy. <laughs> we don't want it to be like that. We don't want that. We want the feeling to grow in the heart so that it lights you up so that the radiance can go out from you. This is what we're actually showing you. So you choose a spiritual friend who is alive, who is of the same sex so that no lust arises. And then you, this person is not a family member to start with. This is the restrictions. It has to be someone that you respect, somebody that you want, you think this person could use some loving kindness. They do good work and it would be powerful for them to get more loving kindness sent towards them. The person does not have to be where you live or in the vicinity. The person can be on the other side of the globe. Yes, it travels to the moon. It travels anywhere. It, it doesn't have any restrictions. It moves through the ethers, okay? So as you're building this power, how does it move from you to someone else? Do I send it? We say send out loving kindness, but we don't mean send out loving kindness. We actually mean be the loving kindness and be like a candle, just like a candle. And this is the wick of the candle. The light is coming from here and it flows out. When you see these lights in here, they're not pushing the light out into the room. They are radiance or radiating the light into the room. So it's just coming out. And what it is is you are the light. So there's two things being taught here. One of them is this is a power, and the power of it is coming from you. You are allowing yourself to be the vehicle or the... Um, the container that holds the light that will shine out. This is the way this is working. So the important thing, that's why it, the important thing is for you personally to feel this feeling in your heart. And this is a feeling meditation. When you sit, I don't want you to sit any less than 30 minutes at a time. And try to do this uh, two times a day if you can. One, some, t some things that people do when they're working and they're trying to learn this and they have a heavy schedule, 
You get up a little earlier in the morning to get dressed, you know, you brush your teeth, take your shower, get dressed, and then sit for 30 minutes before you get in the vehicle and go to work. So you might need to get up early in the morning. And if you're committed to learning this, People have written me and told me they get up at 3.30 in the morning to get this half hour in. That's their time. And nothing is in there. Nothing about class, nothing about schedules, nothing about anatomy. Nothing is in there, okay? Just being is there. Just being there and feeling the loving kindness growing in you to flow outward. That's, that's what we're after. Okay, so once you have it going in you, you send it to yourself for about 10 minutes. And then after the 10 minutes, you just you keep smiling and sending it to yourself. And that's a loop. You're sending it, you're feeling it in your chest, and you're sending it like this to yourself. And it's coming through a loop. And it's going from your head down through your body and like this. That's what it's doing. Okay? After 10 minutes, you take your spiritual friend and you try to visualize your spiritual friend, but for some people it's difficult to visualize the friend. That's okay. If you have a picture, you can see the person on a little altar. You put the person's picture there and send the loving kindness to that person. Okay. Or you say, I'm going to see them like a photograph in my mind. I'm going to see them, and that's how I'm going to send them, send the loving kindness to them. And you start sending this to them, and we've had amazing results with actually the power of what this can do when you start sending this to the person. The person can be in China, and you're on the east coast of the United States, and all of a sudden they pick up the phone, they call you, you haven't talked to them for three years or four years, and there they are. You know, I feel really great, and I've had you on my mind all week, they'll say. And what happened? <laughs> this was the power. See, it's difficult for us in modern times to even fathom the idea that an oath and a vow and a power are something we should pay any attention to. It's not in our cultures anymore. Even in Asia, it's not in the modern culture anymore. It's in the stories, it's in the legends, that kind of thing. But how many of you understand it's the real thing? We don't. We play with it, but we don't really understand. And the only way that we can come to understand the strength of these kinds of things is to have personal experiences with them, to understand this was not a lot of hokey pokey. This was really true. And um, some of the things sound ridiculously silly that are in the, the accounts of things. For instance, even in Sri Lanka, there's one area where um, the fields were so full of monks levitating and floating across the fields that they couldn't pick the rice in time one year. That was documented in one of the documents. What's going on here? Are they really talking about monks levitating? Well, you only have to levitate four or five inches, and if you learn what to do with it, then you can lean in the direction and go, and no, I don't levitate. <laughs> okay. But the point is, think about it. If you do conquer the idea of gravity and get off the ground this far, then all you have to do is tilt and go, you see? So who knows what they were doing? We do know that monks levitate. We do know that it happens with people. How does that happen? Well, that happens basically when a person empties out this tension and tightness completely and completely internalizes the idea there's no weight in the structure of the skeleton anymore. There's nothing there. They and literally become light as a feather. When you were at a party as a child, did you ever play the game where you have one person sitting on the chair and each person goes like this with two fingers, you know, they just go like this, and while, I'm, while she's sitting on a chair without any legs, uh, two people get behind her and they put their fingers under her arm while she's sitting there like this. And two people uh, get on either side of the knees, and they put their two fingers under each knee. And the person might weigh 300 pounds. And then you talk about the feathers, and you talk about the lightness of the air, and you talk about the lightness of the wind, and you start to get them to just stay in an empty place, and they don't weigh anything. And you're light as a feather, light as a feather, light as a feather, and somebody will go like this, lift. 
and the four people will lift a person up and start squealing and laughing because it's a pajama party. <laughs> you know, they'll laugh so hard because the person doesn't weigh anything. They weigh less than the pillow sitting on the bed. How does that work? It works by all of the tension, all of the tightness flowing out of the body and becoming so light that the lightness actually becomes a reality. That's all. That's all it is. And the person is just lifted up easy as pie. And I've seen this done a lot of different times while I was growing up with some of the tiniest girls coming over with their fingers under one of the biggest girls that was there sitting on a chair and then having this work. So there's a lot to these things that we don't understand. But what I'm telling you about loving kindness is it is a power. So you can learn to develop this power first and learn what it actually does. Now, when you're meditating, you do have some control over certain things that is very interesting. One of the interesting parts uh, of this is called the body clock. And people don't understand the body clock is real. What's a body clock? <laughs> I remember saying, oh yeah, what's a body clock? <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking the teacher is crazy here. He's teaching me about a body clock. When we start meditation in our center, one of the first things we do in a retreat the first couple of days is we'll say to the students, when you go to bed, I want you to do two things. You're going to be here 14 days, 10 or 14 days. I want you first to say when you go to sleep, just before you go to sleep, I am going to wake up with a smile on my face and feeling happy. That's the last thing you say before you go to sleep and you close your eyes and go to sleep. The second thing is you set your alarm clock for 5 o'clock but you tell your mind, I am going to get up at precisely 4.55 in the morning and you put your alarm clock next to your bed and the very first thing you see when you open your eyes is the face of the alarm clock. It's fascinating to hear what people say when they come in for their interview that day. You know, I got up at 4.57, or I got up at 4.54, or I got up at 4.56. I can't believe it. I just woke up and looked at the clock and there it was. And by the time you finish the retreat, you realize you actually have a body clock. So you get to the beginning, the beginning stages, bare beginning stages of what is called mastery of determination in the meditation practices. Why not start to learn this from the very beginning with these two little things? You wake up smiling, first thing you do when you wake up, you smile immediately because you put that idea in just before you went to sleep and when you open your eyes, there's the clock and you're very close usually. The first couple of days, you're very close and then you're going to get right on. Then you're going to change the times by instruction by the teacher and see how close you can actually come and have this happen. But this is the beginning of mastery of determinations which a person works on later. But mastery of determinations is learning how to, after you've gone through certain stages and certain jhanas and experienced those, those jhanas, the different levels of understanding, then we back you up and say, okay, now sit in, I'm going to teach you how to sit just in one. And you learn what to say so that you don't go any further. You stay in that one all day. And you learn what it really is and how deep it actually is. And you learn what you think it can be used for. And can I maintain it when I'm walking around? And is it any useful for me at work? And what can it do for me at school? Some of the things that we learn from the first four of these levels of attainment are very useful for us if we're in medicine or we're in research of any kind or in research and development of any kind or laboratory work because in those situations sometimes we have to work very long hours and part of the test I think of going through residency uh, you know internship and residencies when you're training for medical positions 
is can you take it? <laughs> can you, are you really able to take this and have your mind in one piece at the same time? It's really a test of how many hours these people have to work. So is there a way that you can sit for 15 minutes and get two hours of sleep? That's an interesting idea. <laughs> and we found that with um, our engineering research teams that if you gave them this information, they could actually learn how to sit for a minimum of 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, and end up with a feeling they had had two to two and a half hours of sleep. They were totally refreshed, totally ready to go, and they were trying to tell us that was happening. And I think it's quite possible that's true. You're, you're, you're doing that for the mind because the value, the value of an open mind that is rested and peaceful, that has no tension and tightness in it that you've completely let go and you're just letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go, 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 go. That mind can get rested and the body can get rejuvenation. That's the value of these things. So these things can be taught in modern times just the way they can be taught in isolated areas that are doing this in Asia that have been doing it for centuries. You know, but this can be taught in modern meditation practice also. Now, sometimes you're going to want to move in your practice, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in the next one of these uh, tapes. We're going to talk about what to do with some of the things that happen to us when we are meditating in different locations. Your job right now is just to take a look at the fact that you can sit in a good position. You understand the importance of not having any pain. You understand not to be moving at all, to be smiling just slightly so that you're opening up your mind just slightly when you're, when you're sitting, very slightly. It's almost like giggling at the fact that you're now meditating and you never thought you would, but now you're sitting there and you're just very quietly, you're just still and meditate. So the first step is this change from the outside world that's vibrating like this to the, this, this world that is just like that. It's still inside you, but when you first start meditating, you wow, that's really something, you know, because I let go of this stuff that's out. I remember I was in Washington, D.C., and I started sitting, and everything, the traffic is right outside the temple door, and we were inside this big temple where this uh, big Buddha was and we're sitting in the hall but I remember the feeling the first couple of nights doing that of just going from what was my normal day <laughs> to just like this you know just sitting still I didn't make a lot of progress like just like that but I thought it was the most wonderful thing on the face of the earth to even have anything that was like this and look at what we're selling here. <laughs> we're selling, sit still, don't move. <laughs> just, just be quiet, just keep breathing and start to use your metta, smile and send this to the other person. Now the other person, the other person can take a walk with you in your mind, you can take a walk. I used to take a walk and sit on a rock with the person and they'd be sitting next to me in my mind and waiting and every once in a while I'd look at them and finally they just smiled at me. And people say, that's not really going to happen. you got to go see for yourself. I'm not going to tell you. Somebody will call you on the phone or they'll just look at you and go, You'll come running to the teacher and say, oh, they smiled back at me. What happened? <laughs> oh, that stuff doesn't exist. No, well, it really happened. So you have to try to see for yourself because one of the lessons of the Buddha is not to accept what I say, but to accept what you see and to keep using what is good for yourself and good for others to let go what doesn't seem good for yourself or good for others. This is a guideline from the Kalama Sutta. So it's a basic guideline. Doesn't say believe nothing. Does not say that. It stipulates don't believe it unless you can prove it and you experience it for yourself. So I'm going to let you go now and I'm going to put together a few things that we're going to talk about. The problems, the issues that we uh, run into, we're going to look at how does the um, how does the um, meditator experience the 
the links of the dependent origination inside of the practice, how uh, does the meditator run into difficulty, and what are the solutions? And we'll be right back with another segment for this. Thank you.